Now back about 20 years ago, they said, whoops, we're sorry, margin's really bad for you, we lied, whatever, <laughs> we didn't know. It's those, now they're saying it's the, the omega-6s are bad and the omega-3s are good and we're back to this thing. And Now we have a lot of products that are on the shelf that are not butter. They don't call it margarine, they call it something else, but they don't call it margarine, right? There are these, yeah. And I won't, you know, they, they're basically combinations of soy oil. They throw in a little olive oil sometimes. Uh, maybe there's a little fish oil in there. But it's basically, it's margarine, folks. Okay, if you're not eating butter, you're eating margarine, it's just as bad as that margarine that they said was bad. What about trans fats? Trans fats are highly, highly toxic. Yes, terrible stuff. By the way, Casey mentioned before about cooking, overcooking the meat actually changes the saturated fat to trans fats. Trans fats. Yeah, okay. So if you, that's why you do not want to overcook your meat, okay? And let me just tell you that what you guys ate tonight was actually a very healthy meal. It was relatively lower in carb than what would normally be recommended by the food pyramid, okay? Higher in fat and protein, okay? And this is actually fairly balanced. Now, everybody's requirement for fat and protein and, and carbs is different, okay? And some people would require higher levels of fat and protein and lower carbs and other people would be higher in carbs and a little lower in fat. But I can tell you for sure that there is nobody that needs as much carbohydrates as what the food pyramid is recommending, as what the government is recommending. That at least 75% of your calories come from carbs. This is ridiculous. It is a ridiculous amount of carbohydrates. I'll repeat this again. There is nobody that will benefit from a diet that high in carbs. So again, from the same journal, the adverse effects of the cholesterol campaign on health, quality of life, the economy, and medical research are inestimable. It is imperative that the public, health officials, physicians, and patients are apprised of proof that it is misguided, malicious, and malignant. And well, here we are. I'm giving you some proof. This is a very interesting study. This came out of Harvard. They basically looked at 340 people in the hospital that had a heart attack. And they want to see, well, what numbers were bad on these people? Was it their HDL? Was it their LDL? Was it their triglycerides? The results were incredible. <laughs> the ratio of triglycerides to HDL, right? We talked about being tr triglycerides being high, being bad, and low HDL. So if you take that ratio, take the triglycerides divided by the HDL, that ratio was a strong predictor. The relative risk in the highest compared with the lowest quartile was 16. What does that mean in English? The risk of a heart attack was 16 times higher than those that had elevated triglycerides and low HDLs compared to those that had low triglycerides and high HDLs. 16 times different in heart attack risk. Have you heard this before? No. And let me show you why you didn't hear this. Let me go back to the original article. Let's read the conclusion. Here's the conclusion. Our data indicate that fasting triglycerides as a marker for triglyceride-rich lipoproteins may provide valuable information. Well, that's not very exciting now, is it? Why don't they just give the, here's the, here's the results right here. One line up. Why didn't they, the conclusion should have said, oh my God, high triglycerides and low HDL is so incredibly important. Why are we even looking at any other lipids? Yet the, the conclusion didn't say that. It just said it may provide valuable information. So oftentimes what happens when contradictory data comes out, it is hidden from the public and from medical doctors because of the way the conclusion reads. And most doctors, including myself, okay, will read the conclusion first of an article because it takes a lot less time. This is an abstract, by the way. This is actually a Reader's Digest version of the article itself. The article itself could take an hour or two hours to read. The abstract may be five minutes. The conclusion, 30 seconds. So oftentimes, the conclusion does not match what's actually in the article. And this is an example. It really doesn't. So if you just read the conclusion, you say, well, that's not very exciting. I'm not going to read any further. If the conclusion had read, oh my god, 16-fold increase, it would have got somebody's attention. So we've talked about high triglycerides and low HDL. I've repeated this over and over again tonight. What does that mean? High triglycerides, low HDL, and also high insulin. Well, that's called metabolic syndrome. Has anybody ever heard of metabolic syndrome? Okay. You don't hear it talked about too much 
And back in 1987, Dr. I think his name is pronounced Ravens or Ravens, came up with this concept of metabolic syndrome. He was actually ostracized by the medical community for being unscientific, but it basically is a combination of these things. Metabolic syndrome will lead to high blood pressure, adult onset diabetes, coronary artery disease, and obesity. So if you follow the smoking gun here, high carb diets that are low in saturated fat will raise your H triglycerides, lower your HDL, and lead to this in a, a large number of people. Now that doesn't mean that you have to have these things to have diabetes or high blood pressure, heart disease or obesity, but there are a lot of people that have metabolic syndrome. It is very, very common. Now, there are treatments for metabolic syndrome. A lot of people are actually treating the high blood pressure with medications, treating the diabetes with medication, treating the artery disease with medication. But the most important treatment for metabolic syndrome is your diet. If your diet is causing the metabolic syndrome, well, you certainly want to fix what's causing the problem as opposed to just treating the end results of the problem with medications. Now, if you read, and I do a lot of reading, articles on metabolic syndrome, and I didn't include any slides in here today, they will talk about, yes, lifestyle changes are important, and make sure, and then they'll, they'll give it about one paragraph, and then they'll spend the other 95% of the article talking about what drugs to use for high blood pressure, what drugs to use for diabetes, what drugs to use for coronary artery disease, and they'll say, make sure you eat a low-fat diet to treat metabolic syndrome. I swear to God. High-carb, low-fat diets, in addition to what I just said, increased production of this, well, I mentioned this before, VLDL, very low-density lipoprotein. This actually contributes to your fatty liver. Your liver is making this stuff, and your liver starts to become fatty. So fatty liver is caused by this as well. But when your liver becomes fatty, it actually messes up your liver. So it doesn't just get fatty, but it has trouble metabolizing hormones, estrin being one of them. So therefore, you end up with high estrin levels from high-carb, low-fat diets. And high estrogen, in addition to causing all sorts of horrific symptoms hormonally, leads to breast cancer, dysmenorrhea, depression, weight gain, will suppress your thyroid gland. So this diet actually suppresses your thyroid gland. This diet, this high carb, low fat diet, raises your insulin levels, and that also suppresses thyroid function. It's a double whammy. There are so many people that are walking around that are actually hypothyroid and don't know it. This is an article that comes from the American Journal of Cardiology, and it's a very simple study. They looked at eight people, and they basically fed them two different diets. One diet was the standard diet, which is high in carbs, 60% carb, 25% fat, 15% protein. Not even as high as what they're actually recommending. They're recommending 75% versus a lower carb, higher fat diet, 45% fat. Two weeks, one diet, two weeks, wash out, two weeks of the other diet. The results, the 60% carb diet resulted in higher triglycerides and lower HDL without any change in LDL cholesterol concentration. Two weeks on the lower carb, higher saturated fat diet, cut triglycerides in half, while at the same time increasing HDL. Two weeks on a healthy, balanced diet, meaning lower carbs and higher saturated fat, according to the American Journal of Cardiology, don't take my word for it, actually changed the triglyceride HDL ratio and had a, could have a profound effect on metabolic syndrome. What was their conclusion? Given the arthrogenic potential of these changes in lipoprotein metabolism, it seems appropriate to question the wisdom of recommending that Americans should replace saturated fat by carbs. Why are we making this recommendation when it's causing horrible lipid abnormalities? 